So th thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come to Moscow um, in such lovely weather. Uh, it's my job to talk about the ideal heart failure service um, in terms of if you were setting up a heart failure service, what would, what would be the essential components you would want to think about. And everything I'm going to say is, uh, is written down in this uh, document prepared by the Patient Care Committee of the Heart Failure Association, uh, where we tried to, for the whole of Europe, which is obviously a huge place, decide what the basic common uh, denominator uh, things you should have in a heart failure service. Now the first thing I think I just want to start with is, especially when you're thinking about a country which is starting to think about uh, heart failure uh, services, is why would you need one? And I think when we look at the results of clinical trials, and especially the drug treatment trials for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we can get be lulled into a false sense of security. We see these fantastic mortality rates, which have happened, reduction in mortality that's happened over the last 20 or 30 years as we've added in the key uh, drugs for heart failure, the ACE inhibitors, the beta blockers, and more recently the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, so that for patients with chronic heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction, we're looking at one-year mortality rates now of about 5%, or so we think. But of course, these patients are in clinical trials, and they're not our real-life patients that we see uh, in, the, in clinical practice. And real life is much, much worse, I think, as we sh saw in the excellent presentation this morning um, by Dr. Marev. But in the UK... We got a wake-up call when we started auditing with our registry for heart failure. And we looked at patients being admitted to hospital with heart failure, and they had far higher mortality rates, about 10% of them dying in hospital with heart failure. And when they went home, 30% of them were dead a year later. Much, much higher rates of mortality than the clinical trials. And you might say, well, you're just really bad at heart failure in the UK. But I say we're just as bad as everybody else, because the data in the US, 27% to 30% dead at one year. When you actually start systematically auditing all your heart failure, mortality for most patients is still unacceptably high. So that's the first thing. We've, first reason for a heart failure service is we have not cracked heart failure it's still a fatal condition. And the second, uh, we could list a whole number of other uh, reasons for it, but if we think about the problem, it's, in, it's a disease which is increasing in prevalence because of the aging of the population and better treatment of other cardiovascular disease earlier in life, such as hypertension and uh, myocardial infarction. So the patients are elderly, we ask them to take multiple drugs to change their lifestyle. They have many comorbidities. We ask them to come up to frequent hospital clinics to see a ridiculous number of doctors, nurses. So there's a potential here in elderly patients for enormous confusion. And then we wonder why they do not adhere or comply with their therapy. So if you think about the size of the problem and the complexity of heart failure, it's quite obvious that you can't just center care in any one place, whether that's in a hospital or just in primary care. What you set up must cross boundaries between primary care, secondary care, because the patient is, is crossing those boundaries as well. Now, that, it's difficult um, to, for Europe to suggest a, unifying, a unified uh, ideal heart failure service because obviously there are many, many different healthcare systems and that's the first thing. So what we're suggesting here are the minimum things you need to put into your heart failure service and what you do with it will depend on your geography and your economy. But I think there are some key things. Heart failure care should be delivered in a multi-professional manner. It should not just be delivered by one doctor, whether they're a cardiologist or a GP or one nurse. And the goal of a heart failure management program 
is to provide seamless care for the patient across primary and hospital care so that each patient gets optimal uh, heart failure care no matter where they begin their journey, whether that's they appear out of primary care or they appear in the hospital sector. And these are the things that I think are the basic essentials, the ingredients for the recipe here. Heart cardiologists with an interest in heart failure, nurses who are specialists in heart failure, an ability of the service you set up to function across all sectors of care, which will involve the GP with primary care, in your service specific heart failure outpatient clinics, and everybody, the GP, the cardiologist, the nurse, adhering to common guidelines so that the patient's, the patient's treatment is not being um, confused. Okay, if you believe in evidence-based medicine, and we are very... Uh, we're very driven by this in cardiology because we have lots and lots of randomized controlled trials that tell us what to do. Organizing heart failure care in a multidisciplinary way is class 1A evidence. There are many randomized controlled trials of organizing heart failure care that show it make a, shows that it makes a difference. And this is a meta-analysis of uh, several of the early trials of multi-professional care for heart failure showing that if you organize heart failure care with heart failure doctors, heart failure nurses, and GPs, you will reduce mortality, you will reduce readmissions uh, for heart failure, and you're you will improve compliance with medical therapy. So it's the right thing to do. It's also a difficult thing to do. So first of all, let's think about the members that should be in your multi-professional heart failure service. And since I'm a cardiologist, we'll start with a cardiologist. Um, and I think most people in this audience are cardiologists. So I've got to convince you uh, that, that we should have cardiologists with a specific interest in heart failure, and we should have a lot of them. In the document, we've suggested that all big university or teaching hospitals should have a heart failure cardiologist. And if you think of the number of cardiologists who are in hospitals, it varies from country to country. Probably a quarter of them should be dedicated to heart failure. Now, where that's obviously there are many different types of hospitals. This would probably be, be acceptable for a teaching hospital with many cardiologists. In certainly in my country and in many European countries, a lot of hospitals are smaller. They're more district general. They're away from uh, large cities. And they have fewer cardiologists. So usually if you would have, say, three cardiologists in a more district general hospital, it seems reasonable to me that one of them should have a specialist interest in heart failure. Now, in some parts of Europe, there are places where there's only one cardiologist. And I think in these sort of settings, you want to consider in your service whether there's another type of physician that might be able to help a general internal medicine specialist or very often now a care of the elderly physician or a geriatrician who would help. So for Russia, where you don't have uh, heart failure specialists, uh, cardiologists who specialize in heart failure, I suppose the question I have to... I have to answer for you is, is, is why, would you, why would you want one? And I'll, I'll turn it around and say, why wouldn't you? If a disease is very prevalent, it's increasing in prevalence, it has a high uh, mortality rate, morbidity rate, and a very complex management, why wouldn't you want specialists to deal with it? Would you expect, if you had cancer, to see somebody who didn't, wasn't a specialist in cancer? I don't think so. Can I convince you, apart from the, the logic of it, that there's any other reason for doing it? Well, specialist care for heart failure makes a difference. In countries where they do have heart failure, cardiologists specializing in heart failure, they have better outcomes for these patients. That's the case in the United States. And it's also the case in the UK. Looking at our heart failure audit data, this is a couple of years ago, this data, when patients are admitted to hospital with heart failure, about half of them in the UK do not end up in cardiology wards. They end up in general medical wards. If you happen to go to cardiology, you are much more likely to get the right treatment with ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, uh, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. Your, temp your 
10% more likely to get these drugs uh, when you leave hospital. And if you don't get into a cardiology ward, if you are seen by a heart failure specialist on the internal medicine ward, you're much more likely to get the right treatment uh, during the admission and when you leave. And it affects outcomes. So patients who get into cardiology wards, their mortality is about 6%. If you're in general medicine, it's 11%. And if you happen to go somewhere else in the hospital, uh, such as the gynecology wards, the orthopedic wards, much, much worse. If you see a specialist, your mortality is less. Now, of course, a lot of this is driven by age. And uh, obviously, older patients with many comorbidities often end up in general medicine rather than in cardiology. But even when you account for this statistically with Cox proportional hazards mod mo uh, modeling, you can see that age is the biggest predictor of heart failure mortality in hospital. But not getting to cardiology gives you a 76% increased risk of dying in hospital, even when you adjust for all the other things that are associated with mor mortality and heart failure, such as low ejection fraction, worse N NYHA class, heart rate, blood pressure, renal dysfunction. And it just doesn't occur, it just doesn't apply in hospital. It still seems to have an effect once you go home. So we've looked at patients one year, uh, for one year after their admission, and those who are admitted under cardiology still have a much better outcome at one year than those who go into general medicine. And that's the case five years out after their index admission with heart failure. So in the UK, we implemented heart failure cardiology specialization back in 2008, and I think we're now beginning to see a difference, and we're beginning to see that getting cardiologists to heart failure patients in the hospitals, we've reduced our mortality from, it was 11% in 2011, and it's now 9.5% 9, 9 in hospital. I see we started it in 2008. Our, our subspecialty training in cardiology, um, or our training for cardiologists, is um, a five-year course. Three years are of general cardiology that everybody does. And in the last two years, you can go into one of five subspecialties, intervention, electrophysiology, imaging, adult congenital heart disease, and we added uh, heart failure on in 2008. There was a slow start, but enthusiasm developed for it. When we started, everybody still wanted to be an interventional cardiologist. As primary PCI took off in the UK, an interventional cardiologist found they were being up all night, blowing up balloons in people's coronary arteries. I think enthusiasm developed for heart failure where you could still think the next day, you could still do research. And we started heart failure rotations and it's become one of the most popular subspecialties in 2013 because it also can be combined with imaging, uh, either advanced echo or MRI, or combined with device uh, pacemaker implantation. So I think you should have cardiologists with an interest in heart failure. I think also, as Arno was alluding to earlier, you need to engage in setting up a heart failure service, engage GPs, primary care physicians, and often in very large countries with large amounts of primary care physicians, you tend to find that getting one to specialize in cardiovascular disease uh, is a good way around this, uh, and building them into your heart failure program is very important. They're often the first uh, port of call for a patient when they develop heart failure more chronically, and they're also going to call the GP when uh, they become unwell. Heart failure specialist nurses, again, I know you don't have them yet in Russia. I think they're very, very important, and we've suggested in the document that uh, all countries should develop heart failure specialist nurses. They can have many, many roles, uh, depending on your healthcare system, home visits to patients, telephone contact, telemonitoring, running nurse-led clinics. Their main role is in educating the patients about heart failure, but they're also very, very good at up titration of ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. Nurses adhere to protocols far better than doctors. Um, they're much more uh, rigorous about testing renal function, blood pressure uh, than we are. Um, and they're an excellent way to link the hospital and community care. <coughs> 
Guidelines are very important in heart failure services. Now, you don't need to rewrite guidelines. We've all got national and European guidelines, but I think for each service, you have to have local guidelines, which are shorter than the, than the huge guidelines, so that everybody is doing the same with the heart failure patients, be it in the hospital or in the primary care setting. In setting up a service, I think you'd want to uh, consider and set up specialist heart failure clinics so that the GP can refer people in who've got a high BMP or an abnormal ECG to get an accurate diagnosis. In the clinic, hopefully you can place the heart failure cardiologist um, and the nurse can work in the clinic in a supported environment to help with education and up titration of uh, medication. In setting up heart failure services, in terms of the hospital requirements, you have to think about the things you need to be able to um, provide. And I think, obviously, most hospitals provide routine um, uh, hematology, biochemistry, ECG services, but I think something you really ought to think about investing is in BMP. Obviously, having a high-quality echo service is essential, as we've heard before, uh, the coffee break. Obviously, patients with heart, heart failure is not a diagnosis in itself. Once patients got heart failure, we have to go on and work out what's causing it. So you ha have to have access to other testing and coronary angiography if indicated. And then, of course, centers which are managing more advanced heart failure, you have to be able to provide more advanced diagnostic testing with exercise testing, oxygen uptake measurements, right and left heart catheterization and, and cardiac biopsy if necessary. And I think one thing that most heart failure services, which are now well established, are finding you, we need increasing access uh, to magnetic resonance imaging for, for good diagnosis of heart failure. Obviously, you have to think about the therapeutic services as well. Now, it's easy to think about how to provide the drugs, but of course, many patients with heart failure are also going to need revascularization. So if your hospital doesn't provide coronary artery bypass, Surgery, you have to uh, obviously have good referral pathways for that. Similarly, for pacemakers, for CRT, for ICDs, if your hospital doesn't do it, you have to develop good referral links with the center which does. And similarly, for the end of uh, the more advanced therapies such as transplantation or left ventricular assist devices, if you have them, and good links to palliative care for patients uh, whom we can no longer do anything for apart from manage their symptoms. The other thing, I think, in terms of a heart failure service, access to cardiac rehabilitation for heart failure patients is also very uh, essential for their well-being in terms of symptoms. <coughs> in, as well as a good diagnostic service, you obviously have to provide follow-up and monitoring for the patients, and we don't have as good evidence for this in heart failure as we should, but we obviously have to follow up the patients, and the best I think the best advice we can give at the moment is that stable chronic heart failure patients should be followed up at least six monthly with a check on their renal function and have a yearly ECG because about 5% of them per year will develop left bundle branch block. We obviously have to see patients more frequently when they're having up titration of therapy or if they've recently been admitted to hospital when they're at great risk of going straight back in if they're not stabilized or those whose symptoms are deteriorating. We haven't in the document given any advice regarding monitoring with BMP or telemonitoring or serial echo because there's no evidence that that is actually useful at this moment in time. So in terms of putting your money, I wouldn't waste money on monitoring patients with BMP or telemonitoring, but using it diagnostically is very, very cost effective. I think in setting up heart failure programs, it's also important at the same time to set to be able to audit your service to make sure that it is providing quality for patients. Obviously, having registries and databases is an excellent way to do this. And there are many, many quality or process indicators that we can measure which map to good outcomes for heart failure patients. Time from the GP refers them to get, getting seen in the clinic, readmission rates to hospital mortality, Prescri prescription rates of evidence-based therapies for those with reduced ejection fraction. And more and more, our heart failure services are now also, in addition to measuring 
standard hard outcomes like mortality or um, prescription rates, more and more services are looking to evaluate the, the services from the patient's point of view in terms of their symptoms and patient reported outcomes uh, and experience measures. So this is the blueprint of what we think a heart failure service should look like. It should contain the right people, and I would suggest you do need a heart failure cardiologist, a nurse, engagement from the GP, and any others who might be interested as well, such as geriatricians with an interest in heart failure. The purpose is that wherever the patient starts their journey, and they start their journey in multiple places with heart failure, often in the coronary care unit, they appear in the general medical units admitted to hospital breathless. They appear in primary care, as Arno said, more chronically breathless, so that everybody gets access to the correct diagnosis quickly, and then the management plan can be rolled out. And that, that how you're going to roll out the management plan, again, depends on where you are in the world, what personnel you've got, and the severity of sickness of the patient. So for most patients with heart failure, they can be managed in primary care with the help of heart failure nurses for up titration of medication. There are some who are more advanced and are going to require device therapy that are better seen long-term in the hospital sector. Um, but the key thing is that the patient gets the right management plan rolled out for them rather than where it necessarily is done. So that's my message. And since I'm mainly speaking to cardiologists at the moment, if I had heart failure, this is me here, I think before I accepted my inevitable mortality, I would want to see a cardiologist who could maybe do something about it. I wouldn't want just to languish in a general medical ward or be seen by an interventional cardiologist. And I think that's been the main problem for heart failure services throughout Europe. Seeing a cardiologist is like seeing a rare bird. They live in a very rarefied habitat called the cath lab. And they go in there and they shut the door. And they do all the sexy things like the angiograms and the pacemakers. And they forget there's actually a huge wave of patients out there with heart failure, which is a cardiological disease. And I think we have to give more attention to that in the future. Thank you.